hello again gentlemen. Tonight's topic is the intermediate film process for early television transmitters. My name is David and once again I'll be speaking for Professor Barker tonight. Consider the following situation. Average sunlight provides an illumination of roughly 80,000 lumens per square meter. So if an cow discasts 30 lines in a 2 square centimeter space, then each hole is roughly 0.067 centimeter square, or 0.0000067 of a square meter. If you do the math, you will find that at any instant, the illumination on the photocell is, at best, about 0.054 lumens. A good photoelectric cell provides about 1 microampere for 10 lumens of illumination. So with a nip cow disc and sunlight, the photoelectric cell provides about 0.005 microampere of signal on the brightest areas. Using a load resistor of 100,000 ohms, the video signal will be just 0.5 microvolts, and this is for the brightest areas in bright sunlight. On an overcast day, this could be only marginally above the shot noise level of the photo tube. A black and white film, however, will easily be exposed with 10 lumens of illumination. It was her old friend John Logie Baird who first thought of this as a way to get around the low sensitivity of the photocells of the time. In 1925, Herbert Ives, whose photo I have shown here, formally proposed the use of motion picture film as a means of chemical amplification, whereby motion picture film was exposed. Rapidly processed and fed to a disk scanner with only a few seconds delay. Ives felt this was the most feasible way of increasing the sensitivity of the transmitting end. A similar process was proposed at the receiver for theater use, whereby the received image was to be photographed and developed and projected very quickly. There was also a proposal for recording the sound on the same film to keep it in sync with the picture. This method was later known as the intermediate film process. A second variation was to be used for large screen television. In the following photo, Mr. Baird is standing beside a typical theater television system. Note the 30-inch disc on the right-hand side of the equipment. In this method, the transmitted picture was also photographed from the face of the disc by a film camera, quickly processed, and sent to a special film projector, where it was projected onto a large screen by means of the usual arc lamp. This was the first patent covering the recording of a television image for the express purpose of displaying it on a large screen. On May 25th, 1929, J. W. Horton of Electrical Research Products applied for a patent for an intermediate pickup film system. Here you see Mr. Horton, on the right of the photo, with another Bell Systems engineer, observing an early TV demonstration in their laboratory. Fernsa AG in Germany was not privy to the Bell patent information. There was no evidence that they were even trying to devise a live camera at this time. They had turned to the use of motion picture film to solve their problems of the live or outdoor pickup for television. They had come to the same conclusion that Dr. Ives of the Bell Telephone Labs had come to in 1925, that is, since the television scanning of film was an accomplished fact. Why not use motion picture film as the prime source of television signals? Fernsa had designed and built such a system. It was first described in July, 1932, and shown at the Berlin Radio Exhibition in August, 1932. The system had a film camera, which had a film magazine. After exposure, the film was led through a light-tight tunnel to a light-tight cabinet containing the photographic solutions, 
where it was developed and fixed as a negative. It then passed to the television scanning apparatus, where a photocell behind a scanning disc converted the light from the film into electrical impulses, which went to an amplifier and to the transmitter. It was claimed that the whole photographic process was reduced to some 10 seconds. The equipment used a 90-hole nip cow disc revolving at 1,500 revolutions per minute. The projector was of the continuous drive type, not intermittent, for two reasons. First, to avoid subjecting the still moist film to violent stresses, and second, to avoid the splattering of the thin layer of water that covered the film. The soundtrack was recorded in the usual manner on the side of the film so that the 10 to 15 second delay was of no consequence. It was planned to make the apparatus portable so that it could be put into a truck. The following photograph shows how the idea of a remote televisor was ultimately realized using the intermediate film process. It is parked in front of the Berlin Television Transmitting Tower, which today is the site of the excellent Rundfunk Museum. In 1991, Professor and Mrs. Barker were staying at a Novadel in Berlin, and discovered that the museum was just a short walk away. He highly recommends a visit anyone who happens to be in Berlin, and who has an interest in old technology. In this photo we see a camera technician readying the system for a remote broadcast. The next picture shows the system being used to televise a sporting event possibly, in advance of the 1936 Olympic Games. This equipment, and the very new iconoscope cameras, were both used to transmit television pictures to purpose-built TV viewing rooms around the Olympic Village. In the next photo is shown the interior of the roof-mounted camera. Note that it is essentially a standard motion picture unit, though the sound head is missing because the 65-second delay between video and sound means that the sound head is located inside the truck to accommodate the roughly 27 inches of film space between the picture and corresponding sound. The following two photos are, respectively, of the chemical processing tanks and the film drying assembly. The chemical processing included the usual three steps of developing, fixing and washing. A later development eliminated the drying process. Thus, in 1932, Fernsey applied for a patent for an improvement in intermediate film transmission. In this case, the system used an endless band of 17.5 mm film in which a light-sensitive layer was continually applied to the film, exposed in the camera, developed eventually removed by a brush or a similar device and then reprocessed, with fresh emulsion being applied to the film base. It was then fed into a cinematograph projector, which projected it onto the large screen. When used in a transmitter, the film was scanned while still wet. The film was run through an underwater gate through which was directed a beam of light from a 60 ampere arc the disc was driven by a one horsepower, three phase motor, with the disc being enclosed in a vacuum. It ran at 6600 rpm and contained 60 holes arranged on the circumference of a circle. The light from the disc was sent to a photocell of the multiplier type and then passed through a series of amplifiers to the central control room. Transmission was the Baird standard of 240 lines sequential, that is, not interlaced, at 25 frames per second. For the last photo of my presentation, I have a picture of one of the television viewing rooms that were set up in the 1936 Olympic Village. Unlike some such rooms, this one uses the intermediate film projector process that I described earlier in my talk. So that's all for tonight, gentlemen. Thanks for listening.
My next presentation will be either on video recording or large screen television. You'll have to wait and see. Good night.